Okay, so do you all hear me? Do you all see the slides, including online? Yes. Okay, splendid. So, uh, before I start, uh, I would just point, like to point out that, uh, thank you, Kevin, the um, schedule of the ROM session is online, and uh, I know from a reliable source that it's going to be awesome, so do check it out. Uh, for now, it's uh, MOI time, so we pronounce it MOI. Uh, why did we do MOI in the first place? The context of this work is uh, a very simple observation. Uh, so integrated, integrated circuits uh, are at the heart of all electronic devices uh, and all electronic hardware, uh, obviously the hardware that computes encryption also, but cutting edge foundries that actually manufacture these uh, devices are extremely expensive and most nations do not have any. Like, uh, as a consequence, production is uh, pretty much always outsourced. So a company will design its, uh, the, the integrated circuits that they need, and then they will send the specification to the foundry, and then in, in return, they will get the actual physical objects. Overall, more than 90% of all these uh, integrated circuits are produced by only 13 foundries, and they're not in 13 different countries. Is there anything we can do to alleviate the related security risks, but at the primitive level, uh, as far as cryptography is concerned? And obviously, since it's the rhetoric question I asked on the first slide, the answer is yes. But first, why do we care? Um, so when you outsource the production, you might have uh, run into issues if you're, uh, the person you outsource it to, the company, is dishonest. You could have some counterfeiting. They could try to reverse engineer your specification. And they could also potentially do some malicious modifications of the circuit. And we're going to focus on the latter here. And in particular, what they could do is insert what we call hardware trojans uh, into, the, um, into the circuit. So it's very good that this paper was like in the first issue of TOSC to be presented here, because trojans are named after the Trojan horse, obviously. Uh, so hardware trojans, uh, much like the Trojan horse, are inside the device and then start to behave in a, an unwanted way. So for a while, they, it behaves, the device behaves normally, but then it gets triggered and it starts causing some damage, either uh, like in the literal physical sense or in a logical way. What could these triggers be? It could be physical conditions, like there could be a I don't know, sudden temperature spike. You could have a special input uh, that, is, uh, that triggers the special behavior, or you could have just a counter that on input number uh, 10,000, number 10,003, do something. And what kind of damage do we talk about? It could just stop functioning, or it could also start doing more fun stuff like um, revealing secret information, think uh, key material. What can we do? So the countermeasures you can have against hardware trojans, all of them, uh, you could try to detect them by uh, really testing your devices, essentially, or doing some side channel analysis or you could try to prevent them by making the insertion of these uh, Trojans more complicated at the manufacturing uh, stage, for instance. But none of these methods is uh, foolproof and they all are extremely expensive and time consuming. So instead, if what you want to implement is um, an encryption algorithm, what we suggest is based on a previous work by some of the co-authors is to use uh, an encryption algorithm with a very special structure which allows you to do secret sharing for very cheap. So the idea is that you're going to outsource these, the, the manufacturer of the circuits computing these L and M functions, and you are going to manufacture on your own trusted foundry uh, the master <coughs> circuit that only handles this secret sharing. And if your secret sharing is extremely simple, this master circuit will be extremely small, so manageably expensive, and the heavy computations will be done then by these uh, chips that you outsourced and which are cheap as a consequence. So the way it works is that you have your uh, encryption algorithm which only uses linear operations and it actually makes sense, bear with me. Uh, you do some secret sharing for the first operation, you recombine, you do secret sharing for the second operation, you recombine, you do this on several sub-circuits and then you combine with a majority function and you get your ciphertext. What did I mean by using only linear operations? That sounds like an extremely bad idea, but of course we use linear operations in different structures. So L is linear in Z over two to the N Z, uh, and M is a multiplication by an invertible binary matrix. So it's linear in F2 to the power N. 
And then we have a cipher with this structure. So that's MOI, multiplication operated encryption, because when you have multiplications, and there is a small subtlety. We don't just use multiplication by three, which is here. We also use its inverse, so division by three in some sense, uh, because of security analysis reasons that I'm not going to go into because I absolutely do not have the time. Uh, our security claims are 127 bits of security because there is a trivial attack which removes uh, one bit from the, from the master key, the block size and the key size being 128 bits. Uh, and we assume that the data is not going to be more than two to the 64 uh, chosen plain texts. Uh, because these devices are not going to have a very high throughput. So assuming the adversary is going to gather 2 to the 128 is just uh, doesn't make sense in our case. Uh, just a small glimpse at our analysis of the multiplication by three, which is uh, one of the big parts of the paper. Uh, when you look at multiplication by three and then add a feed forward with the identity, the DDT is a Sierpinski triangle. Uh, like that's not, it's actually the DDT uh, of, this, uh, of this function. Um, and it looks nicer and nicer as you grow the, the size uh, of the state. And we can actually prove it also. It's also in the paper. So uh, our aim was to propose a cipher which was tailored specifically for Trojan resilient implementation. And in fact, again, I refer you to the paper. We are competitive in terms of uh, performances for such implementations. Uh, as along the way, in order to achieve this, we had to make an extremely thorough uh, analysis of the properties of the modular multiplication by a constant, and in particular multiplication by three uh, in the modular ring. Uh, we wonder if there could be other applications, because what we have essentially is a block cipher that's extremely suitable for a secret shared implementation. So we had Trojan resili resilience in mind, but there could be other applications, and we'd be very curious to hear about them. Um, and with this, uh, I will conclude my talk. Thank you. So um, thank you, Leo, um, for the nice talk. Do we have any questions in the audience? Good question. Thank you for such a nice talk. Uh, my question is mostly a generalized one. Uh, uh, to what extent uh, this robust, uh, this encryption will be robust uh, for the, the hardware attacks? Uh, what is the limit? Um, I guess it's going to deep. So the question was, the question? yeah. So the question was about how robust uh, the cipher was going to be against uh, hardware attacks. So do you mean side channel attacks or this specifically is hardware Trojans? Uh, side channel attacks, that's a very good question. I have not uh, looked at that uh, and neither have my co-authors as far as I can tell. Uh, but since we have this secret share, if we implement it really in the way that we intend, so with the secret sharing, the input of these uh, chips, of these subchips, uh, the input of uh, L and M will be stati statistically independent from secret data. So if you have a side channel attack which targets L or M, I don't expect it to, to work. We have, we were essentially doing masking here. Uh, so if you uh, try to attack L or M, I think it's okay. But I'm not a side channel attack expert, so uh, do ask someone who should know, would be my advice. Do we have uh, any other quick question? If not, uh, let's thank uh, Leo again. Now we move to the second talk of the session. Um, <coughs> So um, this work is entitled Authros, a low latency PRF, 
It's a work by Subadek Banek, Takanori Isobe, Fukang Liu, Kasuhiko Minamatsu, and Kosei Sakamoto, and Subadek will give the talk. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So uh, I'll be talking about this low latency PRF, which we call Autos. Now, low latency primitives uh, uh, have uh, various applications, like in uh, memory uh, memory bus encryption, uh, encryption of some storage systems, like uh, applications in automobile communication and uh, certain industrial control systems. Now. Uh, most of the low latency primitives available in literature are all invertible block ciphers, like uh, Trees, Karma, and uh, Mantis, for example. So, the question we asked ourselves uh, in the beginning was whether invertible primitives are an exclusive approach for designing low latency constructs, and uh, if not, how one would go about uh, constructing a non invertible primitive. So, the mo motivation was as follows. Uh, we know that there are several modes of operation, like um, counting mode, CMAC, and GCM, that are essentially inverse free, which means they do not require access to the decryption module of the block cipher to operate. And moreover, it was proven that uh, if you were to replace uh, block cipher with a PRF in certain modes of operation, like counter mode, then we can still have uh, BBB security. Also, if you were to replace uh, the block cipher with the PRF in certain modes of operation like the counter mode, then we would uh, altogether stop uh, attacks like uh, those based on missing difference, for example. So a non-inversible primitive would therefore be suitable in certain applications. And so therefore, we initiated a study on um, low latency non-inversible primitives. So the construct we chose to go with was this. It's basically the sum of uh, Two block ciphers is branch one and branch so branch one and branch two. So um, so that way uh, the total latency of the circuit would be the maximum of latencies of branch one and branch two plus latency of the XOR gate. Uh, so it's uh, worthwhile to mention that it was already proven in 2017, I think, that uh, uh, if the block ciphers branch one and branch two are secured PRPs, then uh, this construction is obviously a secure PRF with bended security. However, we can make sure that uh, even if uh, branch one and branch two are not strictly secure, then too it might be difficult to mount uh, any key recovery attack on this construction. So we have uh, analyzed the security of branch one and branch two separately. Uh, as far as we can see, they are still secure, but uh, in order to optimize the latency of the circuit, uh, we keep very slim security margins. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the number of rounds we think uh, the construction should be secure at, and the uh, number of rounds we propose in the specification. So, branch one and branch two are both uh, twelve-round SPNs. Uh, we have four, uh, three different types of rounds. The first four rounds uses a bit-level permutation. Uh, the next seven rounds uses use a nibble permutation, and uh, the last round does not use any. Uh, linear layer at all. The reason we have uh, three different shift row type uh, permutations is basically for ease of analysis. So using the bit permutation rounds, uh, we were able to guarantee full diffusion in two and a half rounds. That is uh, two full rounds on the S box of the third round. But if you were to continue to use uh, bit permutation in the entire branch, it would be difficult for us to Come up with any tight uh, lower bounds on the minimum number of back US boxes. Uh, whereas if we used uh, a nibble permutation layer, we were able to guarantee uh, uh, 60 uh, active S boxes over eight rounds. Uh, so the three diff different types of uh, linear layers is just for ease of analysis. Uh, the S box we use uh, is uh, quite lightweight and has a gate depth of only three or three and a half. Gates, so that supports the cause of low latency. Uh, the mixed column matrix is the same that we that was used in Midori. Um, and you can see that uh, if uh, the cell library used to construct the circuit has a three input XOR gate, then this mixed column circuit can essentially be constructed using a single gate depth. The the 
the the left and right uh, branches are essentially identical except for uh, uh, the bit and the middle permutations used in them uh, and of course uh, the round constants are different so the round constants have been derived from the binary expansion of the digits of pi and uh, uh, the key scheduling function is basically 128 bit permutations of the master key so we do not need any gates in the key scheduling and therefore it does not add to the latency of the primitive. So we uh, benchmarked our design using uh, four different uh, cell libraries and uh, over here we present the results for the STM 90 nanometer library uh, and we compare our designs with uh, uh, other low latency primitives like Karma, Prince, uh, some CRFs of the KJAP family and uh, Subterranean. You can see both with respect to circuitry and latency, our design performs well. So this is a, a plot uh, for area versus latency trade-off. So, so each point in this plot was derived by uh, instructing the circuit compiler to output a circuit that has exactly t nanoseconds of delay between the inputs and output ports for successively lower values of t. And we stopped at the point where uh, the compiler was no longer able to produce a circuit that met the latency requirements. So the plot for um, uh, all throws is this red one over here. I'm sorry, the curve is a little uh, clustered around the left because we included this uh, Kangaroo 12 uh, 1600 PRF that, was, uh, that had a 1600 bit internal state. And so, so this plot has considerably large area. So to conclude, uh, our construction is the sum of two block ciphers that are barely secure. But even then, we expect the security arguments to hold, and I invite the readers to go through the paper for extensive analysis of the security arguments. And with that, uh, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Do we have any questions in the audience? I time for one quick question. Any questions online? If not, let's thank somebody again. Thank you. The next talk will be online. Um, to be given by Kosei Sakamoto. Are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. It's a bit small, as he said. It's more. Can you maybe maybe you can put it in slideshow and not full screen or something like that? Uh, okay. Uh, wait a moment. Uh, is that okay? I don't think it's different. But... Oh, if uh, wait a moment. Uh, oh. Yeah, uh, as Gaetan suggests, maybe share a window instead of a screen. Okay. Uh, is that okay? I guess we'll do with this. Um, so, uh, this work is entitled uh, Roca, an efficient AES-based encryption scheme for beyond 5G. Uh, it is a work by Kosei Sakamoto, Fukang Liu, Yuto Nakano, uh, Shinsaku Kiyomoto, and uh, Takanori Izobe, and uh, Kosei will give the talk. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, 
Uh, first, of, uh, first of all, uh, let me give the uh, background of our work. Uh, as, you, uh, as we know, uh, many research uh, about beyond 5G or 6C has already started around the world. Uh, in 6C era, uh, it is said that the data transmission speed uh, will reach more than 100 Gbps. Uh, for the crypto cryptographic algorithms, uh, it means that the, uh, we need to increase the encryption speed uh, to more than 100 Gbps uh, to avoid the cryptographic algorithms uh, being the bottleneck in the 6C system. Regarding the security, uh, the cryptographic algorithms uh, need to support 256-bit key lengths, uh, which is already required in the 5G system. Uh, for, the, uh, for the requirement of performance, uh, it can be a big matter uh, because uh, when we take Snowby, for example, uh, Snowby only achieves uh, around 40 year BPS in AAD mode. Uh, when we look for other candidates uh, as the cryptographic algorithms uh, in 6D system, uh, we found that several dedicated AEADs such as uh, Aegis family and Shaoxin C46 uh, can be a good choice for 6C. Uh, Aegis and Shaoxin uh, are both designed for high performance applications. Uh, however, uh, you can see in this table, uh, <clears throat> uh, we, can, we cannot meet the both requirement uh, for its performance and uh, security, uh, even with these uh, fast AEADs. Uh, from these backgrounds, uh, in this work, uh, we propose a new AES-based AEAD named ROCA. Uh, ROCA achieves the both requirement for performance and security in 6C, uh, that is uh, achieving the encryption speed of more than 100 gbps and supporting the 256-bit key ranks. The design of ROCA uh, is based on sponge-based sponge construction uh, like in this figure, uh, which is similar to Aegis and Shaoxin. Uh, but uh, more sophisticated uh, in terms of security and uh, performance. As the specification of Roca, uh, Roca has a uh, 256-bit key and 128-bit uh, NAS as inputs and generates 128-bit tags. Uh, uh, you can see more uh, details of the specification of the Roca in paper. Uh, I will describe uh, how to design a fast AEAD. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, uh, the speed of the uh, sponge-based AEAD uh, depends on the speed of their round function. So uh, we first construct a fast round function. Uh, to construct a fast round function, uh, we only use uh, AES-NY and XOR as internal operations, uh, both of which can be executed uh, very fast uh, by the SIMD operations. Uh, among AES-NY operations, uh, we only use uh, aes uh, which conduct uh, one round AES, uh, not the last round. Uh, besides, uh, we improve the uh, gene and nucleic construction and method, uh, which is about uh, how to construct an efficient AES-based run function uh, to be used in AEADs. Uh, after that, uh, we construct a fast AEAD uh, based on the run function we found. Uh, this figure shows our general construction of run function. Uh, our, general uh, our general construction has uh, two improvement from the general construction of the gene antony uh, The first one is that uh, we apply a state permutation uh, before uh, applying uh, XOR uh, or the AS round. Uh, it can be uh, executed cost-free uh, because uh, we can uh, execute uh, this state permutation uh, without any SHMD operations. Uh, the uh, other one is that uh, we apply uh, either XOR uh, or DAS round. Uh, it can minimize the uh, critical path of the round function update. Uh, here is the uh, requirement uh, to find the uh, good, permit uh, good round function in terms of performance. Uh, the first requirement is the lowest rate as possible, uh, which is uh, proposed by Jean and Nikolik and the definition of rate is uh, shown here. 
uh, the rate is the most important parameter uh, to estimate the speed of the learning function. The other requirements are shown here. Uh, next, uh, uh, we take two-step approach to find a, a good round function in terms of security. Uh, first, uh, we found the round function uh, ensure 128-bit security to the forgery attack based on the internal collision. So uh, we evaluate the raw bound uh, for the number of active S-boxes uh, by the MILP and uh, find uh, the round function whose raw bounds uh, is more than 22. And then uh, we evaluate uh, diffusion property among them. Uh, as a result, uh, we found the, this round function and uh, choose it as the round function of Rokka. Uh, here is a, a comparison of speed of round functions. Uh, so uh, as you can see in this table, so our round function is uh, fastest among uh, these round functions. Uh, regarding security of Rokka, uh, uh, we claim uh, 250, 256 bit, key, bit security against key recovery attack and 128 bit security against distinguishing and forgery attacks. And we do not claim any security uh, in the North misuse related key and non key settings. Uh, you can see more de de details of our security evaluation in our paper. Uh, here is the result of the performance evaluation on the laptop. Uh, as you can see, so Roca chips are very uh, impressive uh, encryption speed. And uh, here is the result on mobile. Uh, similar to the result on the laptop, uh, Roca also achieved a very uh, impressive uh, encryption speed uh, even on the uh, mobile. Uh, lastly, uh, I'll conclude uh, my talk. Uh, <coughs> In this work, uh, we presented a new, a new uh, AES based AED named Roca. Uh, Roca achieves uh, both requirement for performance and security in 6C, uh, namely uh, supporting 256 bit key rings and uh, achieving the uh, encryption speed of more than 100 Gbps. So that's all of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do we have uh, any questions for Kosei? In the audience online? Just a quick question, no? People are a bit, uh, a bit shy this, this morning. So I guess uh, we don't have any questions. In this case, uh, we thank you, uh, Kosei, again, and we move thank to the next. Thank you. Should be okay. Oh, this was the old one, right? This work is entitled Perfect Trees, Designing Energy Optimal Symmetric Encryption Primitives. It is by uh, Andrea Caforio, Subadi Benek, Yosuke Todo, Willy Meyer, Takanori Isope, Fukang Liu, and Bin Chang. And uh, Andrea will give the talk, the flow is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, there is a very famous result at FC 2018 that it identified stream ciphers as the most suitable choice for energy efficient encryption for larger quantities of data. And in particular, among all the investigated stream ciphers in this work, Trivium was, or Trivium really outperformed all other schemes, uh, including supposedly efficient schemes, uh, block ciphers like Midori. But still those results were rather observational and, and the comprehensive energy model for stream ciphers uh, remained at large. 
So for block ciphers, the situation is a little different. So in 2016, Bonnick devised an energy model for R round unrolled block ciphers of this uh, quasi quadratic form, where big R is the total number of rounds in the algorithm, and the coefficients A, B, and C encode some circuit specific details. So the reason why a heuristic energy model for stream ciphers is harder to conceive is due to the high degrees of the unrolling factor R, which uh, enormously complicates the underlying algebraic expressions of the state update functions, and thus their study. So in this work, we devised the first energy model in the realm of stream ciphers, uh, achieved through a novel investigation of uh, Trivium. We linked the uh, algebraic topology of the update function to the consumptive behavior. And then our model is applicable to a wide range of uh, stream ciphers, so Trivium-like, grain-like, and subterranean-like constructions. So in the second step, we leverage this obtained energy model and propose two no new energy optimal stream ciphers in the Trivium family that reduce the energy consumption by up to 25% uh, with respect to the original uh, specification. Yeah. So, but the. <laughs> so, more importantly, for the first time, it's now possible to design stream ciphers that are specifically optimized in terms of energy. So a little refresher on Trivium. So tri the Trivium update function uh, consists of three independent logic blocks that are tapped from a state register of size 288. And for the remainder, we just define each of those uh, logic blocks as a strand. It's not hard to see that we can recursively enumerate these strands to get a, a tree-like structures. And if you do this for the fully unrolled cipher for R equals 288, and then synthesize each strand independently, we can measure the power of each strand. If you do this, we get something uh, surprising. So intuitively, we would expect that the power rises with the unrolling degree because the underlying circuits get more and more complicated. But this is not really what happens. We see even for high Rs, there are these sudden dips in, in terms of the power consumption. So when why does this happen? So it happens when the underlying tree of the strand is imperfect. So we say that a strand consumes less power if the node it occupies in the circuit graph houses a perfect tree. So in baseline Trivium, there are 339 perfect strand trees, and that's roughly half of all trees. And this raises naturally the question, what happens if we uh, alter the tab positions of Trivium and obtain configuration that yields more uh, perfect uh, trees? This is what we did. So plotted our um, several hundred random instances of Trivium for multiple frequency and we see a clear and strong correlation in terms of number of perfect trees and the respective power consumption. So out of all these uh, random constructions, uh, we picked two promising candidates for energy efficient trivium replacements. The first one is trivium LEF. So this design features 495 perfect trees and an equivalent security level compared to trivium and reduces the energy consumption by roughly 15%. And our second construction, Trivium LES, with roughly 600 or with 665 trees, perfect trees, uses dynamic consumption by 25% and at the cost of more initialization, initialization runs compared to Trivium and Trivium LEF. So both of them are currently the most energy efficient encryption algorithms uh, known in the literature. So I've a little on a side note, uh, our model naturally extends to other existing Trivium-like ciphers. Uh, here I've plotted some uh, four existing Trivium-like ciphers. And then same thing is also true for Crane or Subterranean family, for the Subterranean family of designs. So in retrospect, uh, in this paper, we proposed the first heuristic energy model for uh, stream ciphers that is applicable to a wide range of constructions. Uh, our model opens the door for future en energy efficient stream cipher designs. And I really want to stress, stress here that the energy consumption of cryptographic algorithm in hardware is really a key aspect when it comes to their integration into low resource environment. And this is further supported by the ongoing NIST lightweight standardization process in which energy consumption is one of the selection criteria, but arguably remains the most obscure, uh, obscure discipline. So in the meantime, we have these two new uh, constructions that reduce the cons cons energy consumption by 15 and 25% respectively. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have uh, any questions for Andrea?
Are you referring to the the work by Maximov and Biryukov? No, it was by Kravium. Oh, Kravium. Yes, so this is here. Oh, okay. So yes, okay. here is Kravium. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, could you enlighten us, like, how hardware plays an important role in implementing these perfect streams? For example, a single core hardware so in that aspect. Uh, how hardware plays an important role in implementing these perfect streams. So, do you get the same energy uh, enhancement uh, if you change the hardware, or is it completely independent of the hardware? Uh, so, we. we... <laughs> So the question was, is uh, are our results like uh, independent of the underlying hardware or do they depend on the hardware? Uh, but I think what you're referring to is the cell library. So in our paper, uh, we repeated those uh, experiments for like a wide range of cell libraries, ranging from very large, uh, very large spacing, like 90 nanometers to like small one, 50 nanometer cell libraries. And the results are unanimously same. Do we have any more questions for Andrea? Online, maybe? No. In this case, let's thank uh, Andrea again. And we now move to uh, another online talk. <clears throat> It'll be given by shutting down. Are you? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, there to give you a presentation of our paper Pure Crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, in Pure Crypto, we implemented a wide range of symmetric cryptographic schemes which provide the most desirable security properties and functionalities confidentiality, integrity, and uh, pseudo randomness. We also realized a protocol called uh, proof of aliveness as a case study to show how to use the implemented cryptographic algorithms. Uh, you can see the details of POC background challenges, hard coding strategies in the video. Uh, we mainly focus on the uh, implementation of the algorithm, algorithm on POC. Uh, I will show some examples of implementation. The first one is a subset sum based one-way function. Such one-way function has a parameter A, which consists of LN numbers. Uh, in a LN bit of U X, the one-way function is computed uh, based on following equation. Let me. Each bit of x is used to determine whether the corresponding parameter small ai will be added. Uh, we first study is the import importance of hard coding the parameters, the big A. Consider the situation that one initialize the parameter A once with a third parameter initialization task, but uh, use it uh, repeatedly across execution scan cycles. However, when such an initialization task is done, the network attackers are able to modify A to launch a tag manipulation attack to recover the pre-image X. Uh, since the LN is not small, we adopt uh, the uh, hard coding to hard code the core statement uh, in, involving AI, not that we cannot we can't use the loop statement anymore due to the hard coding of A. Uh, so we use Python to pre-generate uh, those concrete hard code uh, statements like the following figure. Um, we use the similar idea to realize the shaped zoted functionalities. The left figure 
<laughs> the left uh, figure is a uh, shoulder code for hard coding, and the right figure is uh, resulting ST codes. In the imitation of peasant, we combine the operations in S-box and P-box. From the shooter code of the present, that we implemented a uh, based tax, uh, we realize the S box and P box using sync for instruction. Namely, we implement uh, the S box and P box together for each level of of a state rather than excluding them one after another. Uh, you can say the hard coding implementation of SP layer of present. Oh. Finally, we show the benchmark results of our implementations. Uh, we use a commercial POC from Alan Bradley to run the implemented algorithms. The performance of one-way function and the block ciphers can be found in the following table. We can say that the uh, performance of those algorithms on POC is practical, and all operations only need a few milliseconds. Uh, in particular, the encryption of present is faster than semen that is contrary to the result on other platform. Um, since the implementation of present can be better optimized based on bitwise operations, the performance of ChessK and the corresponding um, PRF or PIG are, are practical as well. However, the performance of these hash functions are not very good on POC, since they require many arithmetic operations that are not well supported on POC. Uh, this is our summary. Uh, formalize all new kind of attacks uh, like a TMA um, propose uh, countermeasures against the TMA in the implementations. Uh, optimize the implementation based on, on bitwise operations. Um, benchmark the performance on a commercial POC. And uh, you can find the link of the open source library on the uh, following website. Thanks. Thank you for the nice talk. Do we have any questions in the audience? Um, I believe we, we skipped the, the, the list of authors at the beginning, so I will go through it uh, right now. So it was a... Uh, uh, a paper by uh, Cheng Yang, Chi Ting Bao, Cheng Lu, uh, Cheng Lu uh, Jin, um, Xiu Liu, and Jiang Ying Chu. <clears throat> so, any questions maybe online? No questions? If not, uh, maybe I have one, which is maybe a bit, uh, a bit uh, 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 simplistic, but... Um, <clears throat> I, I don't believe I've seen uh, an authenticated encryption scheme in your in your library. Do you have one, or do you plan to add one at some point? Okay. Do, do you want me to repeat the question? Oh. This is an open. Open source library. Okay. Well, thank you. And if we have no more questions, I guess we can just thank the speaker again. Okay. We'll move to the next one. Is it also online? will be given by can you are you here okay. 
Perfect. Sorry. That's With uh, Wang Weijia, Fan Yihong, Wu Lixuan, Sun Ling, and Wang Meiqin. Uh, the motivation of this paper is the current demand for devices with limited resources, such as the Internet Things and Radio Frequency Identification Tags. There are many criteria for designing lightweight primitives, and the most popular one should be the gate equivalent required to implement a cipher. Meanwhile, another criterion, latency, is also crucial and has been attracting more and more attention because it plays an important role in the low energy uh, consideration of ciphers. Therefore, this paper focused on the uh, focus on the hardware implementation of linear layers that provide diffusion for many cry, uh, cryptography primitives. Before introducing our framework, we shall make clear the matrix, uh, matrix that are helpful in the proposed solvers to optimize the linear layers. There are two matrix uh, that we focus on. The first metric is the circuit area. It can be evaluated by the number of XOR operations used in the implementation to match matrices. There are three kinds of XORs, and we always use GXOR in this paper. Another metric is latency. We use the depth of the circuit of the matrix to compute it. In this paper, we always focus on the minimum depth of the circuit, and our goal is to search the, the circuit with less number of XOR operations and the minimum depth. Notation node in our paper. For every value in the circuit, we can associate it with a binary vector, and the vector can be used to compute the depth in our framework. Next, we propose the backward framework uh, formally. The backward framework returns a directed graph by splitting nodes directly. The target nodes are the output values of this matrix and the unit nodes are the input values of the matrix. And the integral of each node is zero or two. Uh, every unit node has the integral zero and every non-unit node has the integral two and can represent an XOR operations. Then we deal with two fundamental problems. Uh, the first is how to split nodes with respect to the minimum depth. For example, how to split Y0 into T0 and T1. The second is how to ensure the output of the framework returns can always have the minimum depth. Uh, and can help us to execute the splitting process and solve the pro first problem. For any node Y, we always find two nodes with less depth of to split Y. We give an example. The depth of Y is three, thus the depth of A is two and the depth of B is one. For solving the second problem, we define two sets. The working set contains the nodes that we need to split. The predecessor set contains the nodes that we do not split in this state Note that the nodes in the predecessor nodes, a uh, predecessor set can be reused. In right, ensures that the output has the minimum depth. We always split nodes in the working set, and when every node in the working set uh, is the unit nodes, we can finish our search. Because we cannot achieve an exhaustive search, we have to use heuristics. The idea is to reuse the predecessor nodes. It can reduce the number of XOR operations. Uh, this is an example. Uh, consider mat matrix to be implemented. The minimum depth is three. If we use like BP algorithm, we first generate T1, T2, and T3. The depth of Y4 is three. This means that Y4 cannot be used to generate any values. Finally, uh, the circuit needs 11 XOR operations. However, in our backward framework, we can obtain a circuit in which the depth of Y4 is two, then Y4 can be used again to generate Y0, Y1, and Y2. Finally, we can generate the circuit with only nine operation, uh, XOR operations. 
Thanks for our attention. So uh, thank you for the presentation. I believe once again, we, we didn't mention the, the, the authors uh, at the beginning. So it was uh, Kun Liu, Wei Jia Wang, Yan Hong Fan, Li Xuan Wu, uh, Ling Song, and Making Wang. And uh, maybe for, for the speakers, uh, uh, let's uh, not take the, the habit of uh, skipping the, the introduction uh, for the next talk. Um, <clears throat> do we have any questions for Kun Liu in the audience? Maybe, maybe I have one. Um, um, I, I noticed that now uh, about uh, uh, diffusion matrices, there starts to be uh, quite a lot of different tools. Each one sometimes performs better than the other. Uh, if I have a uh, diffusion matrix, which tool should I use? Do, do we have something to tell me that one tool is better than the other? Do you have an opinion? Can I hear the question clearly, but uh, I think you want to know the the matrix uh, how to use. Uh, we only use the matrix uh, in the hardware. No, no. What, what I like this. What, what what I was asking is, uh, uh, since there are so many tools now in the literature, uh, how how do we compare between these tools? Do, do we have an argument to say that your tool is better than the other, but sometimes better? Pause and we can give the results like this. Compare comparison and two matrices. The the left three uh, columns are the uh, results uh, with results the lim limitation of depth and the uh, right uh, three columns are. Uh, the results with respect to the minimum depth. Okay. In, in my paper. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Um, do we have any other questions in the audience online? If not, uh, let's, let's uh, thank uh, Kun Liu again and all the speakers. <laughs> Yes, let's, let's conclude the, the session. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, uh, this is it for, for session. Hmm?